Hello. First, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Clark Murdoch. I'm a senior advisor here uh, at the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my colleague to my left, Ryan Crotty, uh, is a senior f uh, fellow here and a deputy director for the International Security Program. And Angela Weaver, to my right, uh, works for me as the program coordinator for the Defense and National Security Group and also uh, is a research assistant. The three of us were the co-authors of this study that we're about to talk to you about called Building the 2021 Affordable Military, the Cost-Capped Approach to a defense, Deep Defense Drawdown. I thought I might explain, first of all, what I mean by cost cap. This is a concept I stole from defense appropriators who realized that in struggling to deal with continued growth in uh, acquisition programs and the inflation that would be chronicled every year in terms of the cost inflation said okay we're gonna just cap the amount of dollars you get say for example for F-22s and we're not going to tell you how many F-22s you can buy with that but we are going to tell you 35 billion dollars is all you're going to get we've capped your cost on that so we're taking this approach as I said that originated in my mind uh, with appropriators uh, both the Senate and the House side, uh, and applied it to how do we think about the defense budget as a whole. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, this is a study that uh, started over two years ago. Uh, it was for the first year called um, the, Deep, the Defense Drawdown Study. Uh, it was a pro bono effort in the sense that I didn't have a funder at that time, but knew or believed that uh, we were facing a drawdown that was considerably deeper than people were generally thinking about two years ago, uh, and that we needed to uh, embrace budget realism and start thinking about how we do a deep one. After a year uh, of effort at that time, we were able to get funding for a follow-on project that we call the Affordable Military, which is this is the military you could afford under the budgetary caps. We're taking as reality uh, uh, the Budget Control Act caps that were uh, imposed by Congress, signed by the President in August of 2011. The first tranche of those caps uh, were applied in the FY, started to be applied in the FY12 budget. They mandated $487 billion in cuts over 10 years. Then there was a second tranche of cuts that were called uh, the sequester cuts. Um, actually, it's a little bit of a disnomer. There, there are new budgetary caps that, if they are violated, trigger sequester. Uh, but that round is another $460 billion. It's documented in the report itself. As I said, we had two working group meetings. Uh, Ryan and I have been part of the team for the full two-plus years. Angela joined us. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Angela joined us. Kelly was where the first year Angela joined us uh, in the beginning of 2012. Next slide. Defense drawdowns compared. Uh, this is our first real indication as we started working on this in uh, 2012. This was a chart, that, uh, an earlier version of it, first appeared in the work of David Berteau, one of my colleagues here. Uh, but Ryan was working on that one as well. And as you look at this chart, it becomes clear that while it looks like the drawdown in terms of relative percentage is about the same as previous drawdowns, what differentiates this one is that unlike previous ones, it's only going down to about $500 billion in real terms. All other drawdowns went down to $400 billion in real terms, constant dollars. Uh, why? Because internal cost growth inside the department had drived up costs so much, you essentially could no longer afford to build up, and we didn't during the 9-11, post-9-11 build up, buy lots more uniform personnel, salaries, benefits, uh, medical costs had been going up so much that the build up that occurred during the post-9-11 period consisted of increase of dollars but not increase of uniform personnel. Those extra dollars largely went for uh, civilians, went for contractors, and it went for 
the active uh, duty pay for reservists who had been called up. But as you can see from that line that goes across, did not apply as well to the uniform military. Next slide. Impact of internal cost growth. Uh, what you see here is the first of what we develop, uh, what we call oh my charts, that when you look at it, you say, oh my, because of uh, as several senior Department of Defense officials have. It shows how the impact of internal cost growth is hollowing out the defense budget from within. Uh, the top line is the top line that's mandated by the Budget Control Act. So that's the top-down pressure that most people have been focused on in terms of the projected defense drawdown. But when you look at internal cost growth, it is swallowing up the, the room in the defense budget and essentially forcing a very tough trade-off between modernization and personnel. Uh, healthcare and military personnel look sort of constant, but they're not really because the amount of personnel is actually dropping about 140,000 at that time. This includes the first round of cuts to the Army and to the Marine force structure. So the only reason that they're not rising as well is the number of people are coming down. But the operations and maintenance budget and the acquisition cost growth uh, have been going up and essentially eating available space from within. And one of the things that, as we see on this chart, that in order to restore this, the modernization accounts to this budget out in 2021, which is the last year of the Budget Control Act cuts, you have to essentially give up 166,000 people. If you give that up, you will get 32 percent uh, of the budget for modernization, which is uh, uh, RDT and E and procurement. Next slide. The cost cap methodology uh, is very straightforward. It's explained in the report and then implemented in the report. Uh, there's an annex in it that also describes how it evolved over this two years of the study. Uh, I doubt many of you will be interested in reading a detailed uh, examination of how the methodology, uh, the cost cap methodology evolved, but I have to admit, I find it fascinating. I guess that's why I'm here. Um, we accept the harsh fiscal reality, and then we try to maximize the military utility of the force that is affordable with significantly through. So you have a pre-drawdown force, 2012 is our departure point. You apply the BCA caps. You then build the 2021 sequester force by essentially cutting the budget in the same way uh, that the Budget Control Act mandates, that is, across the board cuts to all programs and activities except for uniform personnel. We built the 2021 baseline force by essentially saying, look, we're going to adapt. You know, the Department of Defense will adapt to a changing environment. Uh, as the drawdown occurs, so you're going to see changes in the composition of forces that the department, uh, the department will have. So the 2021 force that we call the baseline force is an adapted sequester force to new strategic realities. Then we create more options by varying the force structure, still within the cost caps, and then we choose one. The first step, next slide, of the cost cap. Uh, methodology is to redefine how we think about the defense budget, and Ryan is the expert on that. Thanks, Clark. Um, so actually, uh, Angela, if you want to go back one slide for a minute. Um, you know, the key to sort of starting um, to really uh, develop this methodology um, and to execute it um, in a cost-capped way was, in fact, to find the costs that you want to cap and the ones that you want to be able to trade against. Um, so this involves sort of redefining um, and quantifying across the defense budget all the different costs that are sort of inherent um, in, in what we pay for. Um, and then set them up in a way that you could manipulate them um, to demonstrate the trade-offs that you would uh, want to make um, to go from a point where you're looking at this baseline and sequester force that are um, based on inertia to uh, really trading for strategic options. Uh, so in order to facilitate these trade-offs, we developed an approach to, to break down that was targeted at essentially three things. First, um, 
to start with the building blocks that we wanted to work off of. Um, so those were uh, force structure and modernization, um, the procurement and R&D uh, spending. Uh, two, to take those uh, building blocks and apply the cost growth that would demonstrate sort of what the 2021 force really um, can be expected to cost. Um, and finally, by combining these two pieces, look at a fully costed 2021 uh, force um, that can then demonstrate the impact of the drawdown and these inflationary pressures inside the defense budget um, and the capabilities trade-offs that are required uh, under um, the cost caps in 2021. Uh, so with those sort of as the goals uh, that we started with, um, we had essentially a, a four-part methodology. One um, was to pull out the costs that we did not want to be trading against. These are the institutional generating costs uh, for the entire force, um, which is not to say that they are uh, unnecessary overhead, but they don't go to developing sort of combat capability. Um, this is sort of the, the, what we call the institutional support functions. Um, we wanted to be able to separate that, those out for two reasons. One, because we wanted to be trading um, against combat capabilities um, as opposed to the entirety of the, um, of the defense budget. Um, and this is sort of the, the not directly connected to manning, equipping, sustaining um, the force. But also because we wanted uh, in this cost capped methodology to be able to actually try to bring institutional costs down. Um, if the goal of the military is in fact um, to generate fighting forces, uh, then I think one of the goals that you want to aim at, and this is something Clark might want to talk to, but it is to actually um, be able to hold those institutional costs down um, to get more bang for your buck. Um, but then uh, second um, to then after we've pulled out institutional support costs is to take what we call what, what's left, what's the operational force costs, um, the combat, combat support, combat service support costs, um, those functions that are required for military operations, um, and divide them into pieces of force structure and modernization decisions, because those are the things, um, the, the big building blocks that generate military capability and capacity, and those are the things that need to be traded against um, in a real um, budget drawdown scenario when you need to decide what you need to execute your strategy. Um, so then um, we need to um, apply the expected cost growth, which uh, Clark mentioned earlier. Um, this is the more realistic cost growth that we see uh, the Congressional Budget Office talk about, um, what we can uh, realistically expect going forward um, for the cost of health care, the cost of pay and benefits, personnel, um, the cost of acquisition, um, which is a big one, um, as well as the uh, always rapidly rising operation and maintenance costs. Um, to look at a realistic cost in 2021. Um, so to go back to institutional support, um, these were across all budget components. Um, there are elements um, in R&D, in personnel, uh, in O&M, in procurement um, that we pulled off the table for trading against. The operational uh, forces were uh, modernization and force structure to trade against. Um, force structure um, was um, broken down by each service component, so both active uh, and reserve for, uh, for each of the services. Um, and in the report, there's a full breakdown of every force structure unit that was traded against. Um, and once this was broken down, we applied our cost growth and we saw that we had to take $100 billion of, of force structure and modernization out of the force um, in 2021 uh, just to reach back down to the budget caps. Um, so in Appendix D of the report, which is online now, um, you can see the uh, probably overly detailed explanation of how each of these costs were developed, how we got to the point where we were trading against the, the, the core decisions of F-35s, of how many BCTs we should have, of how many carriers and battle groups we, um, we can afford, those sort of big questions, um, you can see how those costs trade against each other. Um, but I know we want to get to the more exciting part, which is, in fact, how we made those decisions, what those decisions were, 
um, and, and how we executed those trade-offs. And for that, I'll turn back to Clark. Thank you. Um, on this, it's important to remember that we're talking about what we've called the double whammy effect on the budget. The top line, because of the Budget Control Act, is coming down 21% during the period 2012 to 2021 at fiscal year 2012 to 2021. Uh, the internal hollowing out effect is 15%, and that's a conservative assumption. It could be as high as 20% or even higher than that. But that's the loss of purchasing power of the defense dollar in terms of the amount of capabilities you can buy with each dollar. Essentially, in using economic terms, the defense dollar is getting weaker and weaker as time goes on because of cost inflation. So you have fewer dollars, 21% fewer dollars, that have 15% less purchasing power uh, in FY 2021. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the methodology, uh, institutional support, what we estimated, modernization, a wedge of modernization uh, that's at the historical average of about 32, 33% of the defense budget which we then had accompanying modernization profiles for each one of our strategic options. As I said, the sequester force, which is a mindless approach to how you do a defense drawdown, nobody's gonna do that, so we came up with the baseline force and then the alternatives that could be added to it. The purpose of this was not to say, you know, we ended up selecting the great power conflict as being the force to go to for reasons that I can explain but the purpose of this is really to demonstrate the methodology, not so much to say everyone should go out and, and endorse the great power conflict alternative for the FY 2021 force. Next slide. These are uh, an elements of the building block that we used uh, of the transition from the sequester force to the baseline force. Uh, we did a lot of work on the future security environment. Angela has an annex in there about the future security environment and the implications of uh, uh, the implications of that future security environment and changes in the evolution of warfare upon what kind of forces you're going to need. Essentially, we looked at three kinds of strategic realities in the 2020 and beyond time period. One is changes in threat, changes in the opportunity, changes in challenges. The second one was evolution in the nature of warfare, greater emphasis upon cyber. Uh, and the third was essentially preserving key American competencies. Uh, for example, situational awareness. We have world-class ISR capabilities. We're gonna seek to maintain that into uh, 2021 and beyond. Uh, so we developed a cheat sheet, essentially said that these are the things we're gonna plus up from the sequester force level. These are the things we're gonna keep it the same and everything else is a bill payer for those first two which meant that our cuts came down disproportionately on those capabilities that we said were not must-have capabilities in 2020 to 2030. Next slide. Um, we built three alternatives. I've talked about those. The choice at that point then was to say, which is the least bad option? Because I think it could be said that each of the options probably lack adequate capability to deal with the full spectrum of challenges you're gonna face in a 2020 one environment. That's the reason why we emphasize that you've got to prepare for a deep drawdown because under the normal or the traditional force planning structure, as uh, Secretary Gates and many other secretaries have emphasized, the United States wants to build the most robust force structure that they can so that they have capabilities that are flexible across the full spectrum of challenges. Well, my argument is in a cost-capped world, you can't afford to do that. So you have to look at the alternatives and say, okay, I'm, even though I'd like to have some of this capability, I've got to put more of my capability into this basket and I just am gonna have, you know, less, you know, you're gonna do less with less. It's not a question of doing more with less. Next slide. Final remarks. Uh, the traditional question, as I said, is that planners, strategists tend to say, let's talk about the strategy and ask how much is enough. And I think given the harsh budgetary realities the Department of Defense faces uh, in a 2021 environment, what they have to ask now is how much is affordable. And you have to start 
with balancing your ends and your means at the very beginning and make a decision if this is an inadequate force maybe you come back and say uh, maybe the sequester level cuts isn't such a good idea we got to figure out another way to solve this people are saying that now but they're saying it out of denial they're not saying this is what it really means in terms of the forces uh, that you're going to have in a 2021 environment uh, but it does explain one thing and that's why the Department of Defense started complaining so vociferously uh, after the passage of the Budget Control Act that this meat acts approach would have a disastrous impact upon uh, US security because they understand and are increasingly understanding and you can see that clearly in the 2014 uh, quadrennial defense review and the follow-on report that talked about the impact of sequester level cuts on the Department of Defense is that the combined effect of the top-down decrease and the internal hollowing out is having a real impact on the capabilities the United States will have in a 2021 time frame. Anyway, uh, I apologize for going on too long. Happy to take any questions. I know it's early in the morning. It's uh, two days before a holiday. Uh, please. Sure. Uh, why don't you go back to slide seven so it's there. The Asia Pacific rebalance obviously has a China component because of the rise of China. But it also has a component that's reassuring, uh, reassuring uh, US allies in the Asia Pacific. So what we did in this force is say this is an emphasis upon, yes, more capabilities that can counter China's growing anti-access area defense uh, capabilities, which themselves are growing, but also increased naval presence in the theater, because that's been an element of the Asia balance, uh, Asia Pacific rebalance uh, strategy from the beginning. And as you know, there's been a considerable debate over how much has that really changed our uh, naval presence. I think recently the CNO said that uh, over 10 years they expected to increase their assets in the Asia Pacific by 15%, I think was the figure that he used. Well, when we applied the sequester caps, uh, I believe it took the carrier force down to seven, mm -hmm. took the carrier force down to seven from where we are today. So we wanted to buy back carriers. Carriers are very expensive. And they also cost $3 billion a year to operate. So that when you buy back carriers and buy back marine force structure uh, to increase your presence in the Asia Pacific, it forces you to cut out a lot of your high-end capabilities. So one of the main differences between the force structure that goes with great power conflict, which is all about countering Russia and China at the high end, is that in that one, we invested a lot more in modernization. We plus up the modernization accounts. We tried to stay ahead of the evolution of warfare. And so the real difference between uh, those two capabilities is the Asia Pacific spends a lot more of its money just in the Asia Pacific and does a lot more to reassure US allies in the Asia Pacific. And the great power conflict one is, uh, Great Power Conflict one is focused on the U.S. global competition with the U.S. with both China and Russia. Uh, and one of the reasons that, that our group recommended Great Power Conflict, and that's just our recommendation out of the options, uh, is that we think recent Russian activities in Eastern Europe and in the Ukraine uh, bring a much more distinct adversarial component to U.S.-Russian relations, and the Chinese, uh, you know, they're not act acting like very much a responsible stakeholder now in terms of the indisputable territorial claims that they're making uh, in the South China Sea. And so we think 
you know, while the Allies might want us to increase our presence more, we think it's probably more important for global security, which includes Allied security, that we do a lot more to deal with those who are threatening everybody than to reassure those people who are being threatened by them. As I think the Japanese uh, Prime Minister just demonstrated in a recent emphasis, they are changing their military structure and philosophy and abandoning some of the the principles of a pacific, uh, pacifist attitude they had to increase their capabilities to deal with China. This is what we think all of our allies have to do. They have to do more on their own defense. We have fewer resources. We'll focus on the big guys. They can focus on protecting their own security. Um, and if I could just add one thing, I think one of the things to keep in mind in this, um, in this cost-constrained environment is that a lot of what we are doing is subtracting less in the areas that are most important. Um, and I've, uh, our colleague here, David Berto, has often said that if we're moving to a Asia-Pacific rebalance that uh, goes from 50-50 in Asia to 60-40, um, that that is probably going to end up being more about subtracting the rest of the world than adding uh, to Asia. And I think that you see that um, in the China trade-offs that we had to make. I mean, if you're planning to uh, look at an Asia-Pacific strategy, where in fact there's one less carrier, I, that's the reality um, that we're sort of living in that we would love to keep all of them. But um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to be able to uh, react to a lot of scenarios there, you have to subtract somewhere. Please. Uh, I can't remember what page it is. It is in the main. It is in the main body of the report, but one of our tables is on the cheat sheet that we used for adapting to 2020, 20 plus strategic realities. So we increased ISR, we increased S and T, R D T and E, we increased soft direct action because you're still going to have. Uh, we now have the Islamic State. Uh, still going to have global terrorism to deal with. Um, we plussed up Air Force long-range capabilities. That's the great power conflict aspect of it. And then Army Reserve components. Why? We wanted to hedge because we're cutting so much Army active structure. We wanted to increase the Army Reserve components. Uh, but we also plussed up Marine force structure because they want the role. We gave them the role of being the United States crisis response force. What we maintained at 2021 sequester force levels. And remember, this is a cut from where we are today. But what we maintain were space, ballistic missile defense, unmanned aerial systems, UASs, and, uh, and the triad, uh, essentially. Everything else was a bill pair, which means that when you look at the detailed force structure charts, and we have one for each of the options, you will see how many F-35s we had to give up to pay for that. Uh, from, from my perspective, the F-35 as a short-legged system, pretty hard to use in a great power conflict kind of mode because that's how you bring U.S. vulnerabilities within the target range of your adversaries during that time. So uh, for me, tactical aircraft are turning into presence reassurance aircraft that are used in relatively safe environments as opposed to trying to penetrate either with missiles or with the delivery system itself into at the high end of a conflict. So that's pretty much it. Now, if you wanted precise, you know, how many F-35s did you have to give up in this world, this world, this world, it's all in there. Because what we did is a modernization profile. The modernization profile is not year by year the way force structure is, uh, where we have a year by year inflationary effect. What we did was total all of the modernization dollars during the FY12 uh, to FY21 period. That equals $1.8 trillion. And then because annual buys vary so much, we were then able to take the profile of today's force uh, and create the cost of that in 2021 dollars. And that created the, today's force in 2021 dollars was about 140 billion, wasn't it? 140 billion over the budget cap. So then you apply the budget cap to bring it down. 
both for force structure and for the modernization profile. Sure. And thank you. <laughs> Um, I have to admit, uh, I'm a capabilities guy, and when you don't have many dollars, you don't have dollars to spend on keeping the defense industrial base healthy in order to be able to build capabilities that you can't afford to buy. That's the thing I think about dealing with the budget realities that we're in now. You have to focus your dollars on the must-have capabilities. And if you buy those, you'll keep that portion, hopefully, of uh, the defense industrial base healthy. Uh, although healthy will be a relative statement because dollars are going down during that time. So there is an industrial base problem during this time. We will not have, we do not have the industrial base that we had during the Cold War. We don't have the industrial base today that we had uh, 10 years after the Cold War because there's been a gradual decline in the purchasing power and when there are fewer dollars being spent, people look elsewhere. That's why the Defense Department is be having to become more adaptive and flexible and, and deriving its technological advances out of the private sector during that time. Uh, so when you have fewer dollars, uh, it forces you into lots of economies of a strategic nature. And part of the point that we made very explicitly is that when we capped the dollars, we're not trying to say that the 2021 baseline force or any of its strategic alternatives are sufficient to meet the challenges that we're actually going to have in 2021. One of the purposes of this study is to strengthen the case for those who are advocating that's not enough. We have to have more capabilities for it. Uh, my belief is, is that one of the ways you do that is by accepting the reality of what's in the law. And when I hear people from both sides of the aisle in Congress saying, sequester ain't going away, you know, and, uh, and I look at the prospects for the midterms coming up and a couple more years of political paralysis there, and then you start thinking through scenarios once it's in the law now, and it is in the law, uh, the Budget Control Act is there, and people are saying, well, we didn't apply it the first couple of years. Well, I, yeah, we did, actually, because while the sequester level cuts were supposed to be about 50 to $52 billion per year, there were some adjustments made so that in FY, um, FY14, it was only $35 billion. Well, that's still a cut. That's not an increase. We had planned increases at the end of the Gates, or uh, second to last year of the Gates administration in the Department of Defense, for like a steady growth along with the rate of inflation. I think it was about 1.5%, something like that. Well, we're not in those days anymore. 